Hi, uh, it's Lou Cloud, Open Framework for Cloud Service Relocation. Um, first up, big hello, hello. Uh, hello. I'm <laughs> hello. I'm Andy Edmonds. I come from Zurich University of Applied Sciences. Uh, there, I'm the deputy lab director, and I work a lot in infrastructure as a service. This talk is going to be a little bit, let's say, above the data center and between the data centers, as opposed to the wonderful stuff that we've seen on nested virtualization. First and foremost, is th there's a lot of work gone into this. In fact, there's a lot of co-authors here. Um, we've had the guys, Thais from Intel, Dana from the University of Western Timisoara in Romania, Eric from Sweden, Jamie from France, and Plan from Bulgaria. Um, so it's not just all of me, but um, for those that are feeling a little bit sleepy right now, and may want to fall asleep or go get lunch because you may be hungry, these are the main points just to remember about Fluid Cloud itself. It's, it enables the relocation of service instances. Instances, okay, that's the key word there. Uh, it's an integrated framework and approach. It's extensible. It can, and in some cases, does solve the challenge of interoperability, which is a rather large challenge, I think, in infrastructure. And for my opinion, at least, it's a rich driver of research. So onwards are to sleep. It's your choice. So very quickly, uh, an overview, right? So I've, I actually, I'll give a little bit of history as to where this all came about. The key questions that it's wishing to answer and solve. The whys, the for what, the actual key enablers that Fluid Cloud needs to have, the architecture, the implementation of it, and the results, the results as a POC, a proof of concept. And then finally, the future work that will continue on. So where did it come from? So gosh, it must have been last year, around September. Uh, I saw some random, random link, and it was an email migration tool. And I said, hey, you know what? Wouldn't it be cool if you could do that with virtual machines? Wouldn't it be cool if you could do that with cloud services in general? Pull them from one provider and move them across. And as I was going along and picking up more links as I went, I, you, I'd stumble across InterCloud. And InterCloud was a term key, or coined by Kevin Kelly. I think he's a, a, a writer over at Wired.com. But it was subsequently picked up with IEEE and one of their standardization groups. And it was pushed on further by a guy called Dave Bernstein. And the whole idea there is that you have lots of cloud services, let's, um, for particular cases, infrastructure, platform, and you're seeing multiple uh, providers of these services pop up all around. And suddenly you start to, to need uh, supporting services, so like brokerages or uh, trusted root authorities and things like that. And in such a fu future vision, it was thinking, well, hey, look, if you've got all of these guys out there and they're all of this similar service type, wouldn't it be great if I can just simply copy a service from one to another or move a, a service from one to another, just like you have in operating systems today locally, albeit. And then the, the finally, and let's say maybe more esoteric, was a swarm of quadcopters. And this sort of, cut, it's, it's a little bit way out off the, the beaten path, perhaps. But the ease of movement that these swarm copters had in adapting to their environments really struck a note in my head. And I just saw these swarm copters as being cloud resources, floating about. They come into a small, constrained environment. They adapt accordingly. They move out into a larger environment. And they adapt correspondingly. So this all then led to a couple of discussions, and then we formulated the key question, the key question that we wished to solve. And that was how to intrinsically enable and fully automate relocation of service instances between clouds. And so we came up and said, hey, it all sounds like fluidity, cloud fluidity. And so we called it, hey, it's, it's fluid cloud. And then we, we started to say, OK, this is wonderful, and it's sort of you know, blue sky thinking. I said, you know, why? Why other than just a, a wonderful metaphor, right? <laughs> at least from my opinion, at least. One is the ease of movement. Uh, the, we, we, in the paper, we note something like a, a bill of rights for movement. And that's a little bit, let's say, almost extreme. I think it was even picked up by one of the, com the reviewers of the paper. Uh, but nonetheless, the ease of movement provides you the provider independence that's needed today in cloud. And so that by having that ease of movement and having that independence, you reduce risk. And unfortunately, I'll have to use the word lock-in, but at least being anchored to one provider. And in a way, you provide an insurance, an insurance of uh, no lock-in. And that's another argumentation that I would use in some of the work in cloud standardization. I co-chair uh, the Open Cloud Computing Interface 
uh, out of OGF. And there we talk about interfaces and standardized interfaces of providing uh, interoperability insurance. So this is taking that approach, but from a completely different angle. From the technical perspective, we have a lot of disparate technologies out there, and they do wonderful jobs. We also have specifications out there, and they do something very specific and focused. But from the perspective of Fluid Cloud, there's no integration of these. There's, there's no uh, one framework or one place on GitHub that I can go and download some libraries and spool up a service so that it can pull across my particular cloud service across. So like I said, they're all cool, but they're not integrated, and there are features missing. And the feature there that's really missing is essentially something like a web dav. Uh, HTTP command, right? So I just wanted to essentially say, post my compute, the, uh, the UUID, and with, let's say, a HTTP header to the final destination of where it needs to get to. Very simple from the API perspective, rather complicated in terms of the implementation. I think Adrian Cockcroft mentioned that uh, in his keynote today. The API keep it simple, granular, but the implementation is going to be rather complicated at the back end. So then the question, you know, I, and I think I'm almost leading myself down the argumentation path or garden path. Is there a need? Well, from our perspective, yes, there's a need because we have these multiple uh, building block type solutions. They're partial. And for to have multiple efforts out there doing this very same thing, uh, you're, you're repeating the complexity of integration. So we say, saw that there was the need for the framework for service relocation. And ultimately, we want, and at least that's the goal, and this is a bit of my background as well, we want to be able to remove that lock-in. We want to be able to free those services. So, you know, like, and there's Chef Braveheart, right? He's saying Fluid Cloud can do it, right? But for what? So we have the ideation done, and the next thing is how, how can we use it? We don't want to just have a solution and then go look for a problem. So we took it from two aspects, the business-oriented use cases and the technical use cases. The first business use case was essentially the startup. And when I first started thinking about this, and actually, oh, that doesn't look too good. So anyway, I'll keep talking. Um, the, the first idea was that you had a startup, and his quote-unquote SLAs are constantly being violated. Of course, in the cloud, SLAs, in my opinion, anyway, do not matter. You set up the monitoring tools, you adjust and adapt accordingly. So, on revising this, we actually saw the case of Zynga as being rather useful and interesting. You had a cloud deployment, you had your service topology deployed somewhere on the cloud, yet you now want to bring most of it or partial, partial pieces of it back into, let's say, private infrastructure. The second, pretty more obvious one, was the uh, cloud service provider. This is a case that Cloud Sigma rather liked, where that they could offer a service out there that you could bring your current cloud deployment, let's say with EC2, and pull it back in onto Cloud Sigma's infrastructure. Third was the cloud broker. Cloud brokers, I guess we don't see, they're not in common place today. If you read the Gartners out there, they'll say that they're gonna happen in the next two years. If they do, who knows? Who, whatever, for right now, this provided an interesting business use case where you did have a cloud broker. Uh, actually, the guy, Jamie, he, He's got an open source project on cloud brokerage itself called Compatible One. Um, and this is where that you could supply short-term policies in terms of the resources that you actually needed currently today, but a long-term policy, let's say a goal, a, a, an optimization goal that cost reduction was to be respected. And if, in terms of over time, the cloud brokerage broker could actually learn of cheaper offers, then it could use uh, the Fluid Cloud technologies to move the service instances between. From then, we moved on to the technical use cases. And then this is the most obvious one. And to be honest, this one isn't particularly interesting. I don't think at least, let's say, in future terms. It's taking one VM and moving it across to another cloud provider. There's a, some aspects of introspection of the VM itself and try to understand what it is, what its resources are and then moving it across to a suitable uh, cloud service provider, a target cloud service provider. This, and one thing I must note about Fluid Cloud, we do not uh, purport the idea of live migrations. 
Okay? We don't see that live migrations work particularly well, especially when you consider the geographic separation of some data centers. You'll actually see it in vMotion that they actually stipulate, I think it's 650 kilometers distance between. And after that, the live migrations start to run into trouble. The second is it relocating platform services. So in this case, we had a node.js application, and we wanted to move it from one provider, say OpenShift, or we wanted to move it across to a second, Cloud Foundry. And then the question is, is what needs to be done, not only in terms of matching the correct platform and capabilities, but also trying to understand the dependencies of the application itself. So does the Node.js application, for example, use MongoDB? If it does, then the MongoDB service needs to be present on the target platform. And finally, the, and more so with this, and I just mentioned the future work piece, but moving an infrastructure service up onto platform as a service. So the case here was that we had that Node.js application that was, let's say, installed with Puppet and that it had a MongoDB instance either running locally or within on the same service provider. Could you actually move that application across onto Cloud Foundry? Or could you, in fact, take a Google App Engine Java application and remove it across onto Cloud Foundry? And in that case, you would need a, a quite an amount of adaptation with respect to the service, for example, using reflection and adapter libraries. In fact, you can somewhat do that today using a red, Red Hat has a library out there, or it's a service called Cape Dwarf, which allows you to take your Google App Engine and move it across. And that, but that's only for um, the platform as a service to a service. Anyhow. So with the use cases in mind, we, 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 need, the key, we need to synthesize what the key enabling concepts were. And these are the key enabling concepts. We have service relo instance relocation, service instance adaptation, and data relocation. Service instance relocation is essentially the orchestration process that needs to happen in order to ensure that all conversions, transformations, et cetera, happens in, a, in somewhat of a pipeline from the source to the target. The service instance adaptation was essentially the looking inside the VM and understanding what needed to change in terms of dependencies. Data relocation, finally, and the, the data relocation is always the heavyweight in the room here. Um, this is the guy that there could be possible data transformations required. It's quite difficult, in fact, to try to come up with some master schema for all data. It's like people in open grid form has tried it. They have something called Daffodil out there that allows you to append metadata to data structures and uh, schemas. But th this one is the more challenging one. And so with all of these key uh, requirements and concepts, we formulated and brought them together in the architecture. And that's the architecture of the Fluid Cloud framework. And there, if you, if you look and just bear your focus upon the central aisle, essentially, from Cloud Conduit down to Broker, you have, and then onto Viaduct and Migrator, they're the key components within the Fluid Cloud architecture. Either side, you've got this, the, the source and then the target, they're in yellow, and then the service that needs to be migrated or moved is there up on our, in orange. The Cloud Conduit itself, it orchestrates the process, like I said. It introspects the service instances, and then also then makes the requests for particular resources against the broker. And it's the broker that understands what target platforms are available for uh, movement and relocation. It also knows about something, some things called migrators. And the migrators are the actual active components that does the process of transformation if required in moving from one service to another. Those migrators are organized in a logical entity known as a viaduct. And that's essentially a, a workflow. And those migrators within the workflow can run sequentially or in parallel, depending on the type of implementation required for the migration to that new service provider. And of course, then the migrators themselves, it's it within the migrators that actually the real work gets done. And th this is essentially the reuse of tools and libraries out there for the adaptation of, of a particular task. So with the architecture, we then needed a, a proof of concept implementation idea. And so the scenario itself 
of course, was using OpenStack. No surprise there. Everybody seems to use OpenStack today. And we want to be able to move a service that was implemented and running upon OpenStack on our, uh, in our test data centers. We wanted to move it across to SmartOS. Now, SmartOS is not necessarily a cloud, quote unquote, OS, but we wanted to be able to move the compute and the block storage facilities that were up, up running on OpenStack onto the SmartOS platform. It's a, it's a hypervisor platform as opposed to a cloud platform. More details on the scenario itself. So there you see, just there and up on the left, was the original, so the before, and all the services are hosted within the one provider. And the, the services there, we had compute represented as a virtual machine. We have block storage, it was uh, NovaVal back then, now, nowadays known as Cinder. And then we had object storage, object storage provided by um, Swift. We wanted, however, then, through the use of Fluid Cloud to be able to move, a, but albeit partially move, the service itself. So we wanted to split the topology, and we wanted to move the compute over to SmartOS, and we wanted to move the block storage over onto SmartOS. What that required in terms of adaptation was modification of the service configuration, aspects related to block storage, because on SmartOS and SDC and in Joint, you don't get block storage services. So an adaptation was required there. And then finally, access to object storage. There was no changes, in fact, needed. So that's what the POC implementation itself looks like. It's, it's rather simple. It's a proof of concept. The core idea here in this POC implementation was to prove the idea, not necessarily to say, hey, look, it's faster. It was to prove that we could actually do it with some code. And there you'll see the implementation of the cloud conduit. The cloud conduit itself has the adaptation pieces hard-coded in there. In fact, for future work, what would be required is that that is pluggable. And that, however, unfortunately, is not reflected in the architecture, which would be updated. The broker itself has the set of migrators hard-coded, as so does it have the target service itself, which in this case is SmartOS. In order to accomplish the migration, we had three migrators. We had a VM image migrator, we had a block storage to VM migrator, and that's very much specific to SmartOS, and we had then the service reconfiguration migrator. The VM image migrator, that was essentially rather cheekily, um, what we did was we used DD and we netcatted it across to the provision SmartOS uh, machine. Simply then, what we did on the smart OS was that we recompile, or not, sorry, recompile, we rebooted it. We were able then to tear down the OpenStack VM, and that had our contents of the VM over there. Now, that's one approach in doing this. Many people out there today use Puppet Chef, various configuration management tools. Those would be more efficient at doing that there. The block storage, that was essentially a wrapper around SFTP. We had some files within the, the volume that we need to push across to the SmartOS virtual machine. That was already up and running with SSH enabled, and that was rather easy. Finally, and even more easy, was the service reconfiguration. That was essentially a set of regular expressions that ran down through the actual small little Node.js application that we were running there. And that small little Node.js application, its sole purpose was to push back the contents of a file that was on the block storage and also to serve back images that were hosted up on the S3, or sorry, not S3, but on the Swift object storage uh, service itself. So the results, so, so somewhat sort of <laughs> nice for us, I guess. In terms of the architecture, it, it was successful. And successful so far, because what we've yet to do with this is actually test it with platform as a service to platform as a service. And that, that'll be an interesting stage. And more interesting, again, will be infrastructure as a service to platform as a service. The initial, we, we got some rough initial estimated, uh, not even estimated, but rough metrics. The POC <coughs> relocation was accomplished in approximately 10 minutes. There was, say, five minutes to, for the VM uh, adaptation, one for the, uh, the block storage. That was rather minor, given it was just SFTP. And, all of this was happening on a, a local switched one gig ethernet network. Um, out of this really, the, 
what we saw, and it most, it's most obvious, was that the data f transfer was the time-heavy component of the whole thing. So the, the question is, you know, how long would tan and bound station wagons still exist? Um, what was, I thought was rather interesting with uh, Adrian's talk earlier on was that he showed the movement of data from one Amazon region to another and with a bandwidth of approximately, he said, nine gigabits a second. So perhaps uh, technology is catching up. Um, is it crazy? So we all, I'm always asking the question, is it? But there, there are similar tools out there today that actually somewhat goes in the direction of where Fluid Cloud wants to. You have Pipe. Pipe will take your uh, Google Docs that are running on Google Drive and push them across onto Dropbox and do the conversion of the file formats for you. So that's the, very much similar to the viaducts and the migrators. Cloud Velocity and Race Me Cloud Path, in fact, actually do the infrastructure to infrastructure relocation between different clouds. So you have Amazon EC2 and you do have um, Rackspace, and that migration can happen with those tools. So in terms of the future work that we want to get done, what's quite interesting is the service decomposition over multiple providers. And can you provide the same level of experience and guarantee the same I would say SLOs, but I would sort of squint at my own self. And c could th can that be done? The investigation of infrastructure as a service, the platform as a service, still has to complete. More work on the adaptation and introspection of various different other platforms. Uh, data payload optimizations, obviously. And work on the platform as a, to platform as a service should be done. So that's pretty much it. Thanks for your attention. I, nobody ran out, so it <laughs> can't have been all that bad. Um, questions from anybody? If you haven't a clue, I've got some there. So. Uh, hi. Hello. The end goal is certainly very important. What I want to ask is, uh, to what extent was your conversion automated? Did it happen on its own? Did you do things manually? How do you see it? Now, and how do you see it progressing in the future? Yeah, no, the, the automation itself, it was fully automated. So we had these components that were implemented as Python classes that were all listening on to and receiving AMQ messages. So they would be spooled up and started up, and then the particular process that was encoded within it was done. We, we have been playing with tools to generate images of VMs automatically. And I see many details, and you know, the devil's in details. I see many things I'd like to ask, like you converted a VM from a Nova installation to a smart OS installation. Let's say the hypervisors were different, KVM to Zen. Yeah. You have to change the block drivers. Absolutely. Do you do it automatically? No, so, we, uh, so what was rather convenient, I guess, for our particular case is that there were HVMs, okay, in terms of hypervisors. Mm -hmm. There was no modification needed for the actual operating system themselves. And uh, so- th even Even, even minor things, uh, drive names. Uh, one is, uh, I don't know, VDA. In the next machine, it could mm -hmm. be VDB. Uh, F file system identifiers. One mounts uh, slash dev VDA in FSTAB, the other mounts slash VDB. How can you do it automatically? How do you even know that the VM is SSH enabled? Do so you that, expect that, the VM to be SSH enabled yeah. so you SSH into it? And so that's the aspect on the introspection work. And that there is future work that most definitely needed there. And it's at, at the, 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 the component, which is the cloud conduit, it's there that does the introspection. And, and the introspection needs to happen on both sides. And that's why both virtual machines were never teared down until the actual uh, VM migration exactly. was complete. Exactly. So my point would be that perhaps the assumptions made uh, restrict the usability of the approach in the sense that you need SSH access, you need to know where certain binaries are, you need to know, uh, you need to have certain heuristics like block drivers and yes. mount points and uh, block, m block migrations, for example. You mentioned files, so you didn't actually do a dump of the block device to a different block device. You migrated no. certain files and which you knew were mounted under slash so, MNT. So, the, so, and so these the, are all assumptions yeah, that... And the, 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 the the aspect here is, is that the platforms do differ. And so the, how the actual heuristics or the logic, it is encoded in the migrators. And so for the particular case of OpenStack to SmartOS, right, SmartOS does not have uh, a block uh, storage exactly. service. And so that's encoded 
in the actual particular case. In this case, it was the, uh, the POC, right? It is extensible, it's adaptable. The migrators aren't fixed. You can add in your own migrator as you need. Exactly, just one final thing that, sure. that a block device is mounted under slash MNT is not OpenStack specific. So you can't actually code it into an OpenStack specific migrator, it's VM specific. The yeah. mount points. So, so like from the, open to from the OpenStack perspective, I can go through to the Cinder API and I can understand where the mount point is at. Okay, I can inspect into the virtual machine itself. Okay, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's right. a different discussion. Perhaps the Cinder API shouldn't even have a mount point in it because it's VM specific. It's not uh, virtual hardware specific. But anyway, yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank cool, thanks. So I tried to uh, to ask probably th these questions in a different way. So, how much effort you invest implemented the generic framework compared to the effort that you invest in implementing the concrete parts that are cloud specific mm -hmm. and how much will it cost to support a different cloud to add the... Okay, so th in terms of uh, effort spent? The yeah, effort from code base perspective. Yeah, I yeah. Mean. So there was more effort at least applied into the actual framework itself as opposed to the actual uh, the POC pieces. We wanted to, um, for, I don't know if it was perhaps overall the uh, correct approach, but to take from the architecture and down to the POC. The POCs themselves, they were rather lightweight. In fact, we were calling out the system utilities most of the time. There was not a lot, as I said, there was hard coding, for example, of the particular target mm -hmm. service providers that were there. There was hard coding indeed of the migrators that were there too. And so it was rather lightweight in terms of the actual implementation. I mean, from, it's like 10% you invested in the generic framework and 90% of the time, or the code you invest, implementing adapter for this specific platform, it was 50-50, ah, okay. 70-30, I don't know. Yeah, That's yeah. what I'm trying to. So I, I would say most of the work went into the actual uh, architecture and the implementation of it, such that it could be extendable. Uh, so in, in terms of, not in terms of time, but in terms of effort, I'd say you would have had, let's say, a 65-35 split. Thanks. I have a more high level question, I would say. So if you go back to your uh, proof of concept architecture slide, uh, I was wondering if you're maybe missing some blocks somewhere there on network migration, because I guess if you have a service that spans multiple VMs, you will also need some way to actually migrate that network state. Like there are some VMs that can talk to each other, whereas some others cannot, and so on and yeah. so forth, whereas you don't have anything about network whatsoever. So, so in th at least in terms of, so by you say network state, do you mean as in uh, runtime state? I'm saying you have multiple VMs. Yeah. I don't know if you have a service, a multi-tier service. There are some, you know, VMs inside one one tier will be talking to each other, whereas mm -hmm. VMs from other across tiers will not be talking to each other. So this is like a network state, you can call it that way or okay. whatever. So, so in terms of a network model then, rather than a state, because I'm just a little bit sensitive to things like um, oh, forwarding tables and things like that, if that's what you mean. Think of firewall rules. Uh, okay. If you're talking about infrastructure as a service, you know, translating to mm. infrastructure as a service, then, you know, firewall rules, for instance. Yeah. Are you taking care of that? Do you have anything, you know, related so, to this? So that again is the case where, so if I take the example from just thinking from OpenStack itself, let's say I've got a virtual two virtual machines and they're on an L2 network that's provided by Quantum. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, ca I can, inspect the configuration of that service topology through the OpenStack APIs. And I can also understand what type of network services are available. So, well, yeah. Okay. This and, th and then the thing for me is then I need to go match that. And I need to go match that on a, the target, the potential target uh, cloud service provider. Do they have this roughly the same capabilities? Do they have an L2 networking service that I can avail of? Yeah. And then can I then connect, or sorry, instantiate that, and instantiate the VMs in the same configuration. Yeah, I think it won't be transparent, but uh, but I just think that, you know, at some point you, you need at least some block or at least some discussion about this part, because it, to me at least, it, maybe I'm a networking guy, it was not really intuitive, you know, how you're gonna do it sure. all together. Okay, cool, thanks. Okay, thank you.